These are the folks who are studying and maintaining some of the four and a half million specimens for science that we have at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Split between our building in downtown Raleigh and the research lab, which is located at our Prairie Ridge Eco Station. Uh, on Monday, we had a chat with the director of the museum, Dr. Eric Dorfman, who talked a little bit about why collections are important to have and the kinds of things we can learn from collections. Yesterday, we talked with our ichthyology collections folks, Alex and Gabriella, who gave us some insight into maintaining and studying fish and diversity in the southeastern United States and globally. And today for our program, we are going to be chatting with the research curator for mollusks at the museum, Dr. Arthur Bogan. Art, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. So everybody, uh, so that you know, um, the mollusk collection at the museum is, I think, Art, and you might have to correct me, but probably the most complete at least definitely the coolest collection of freshwater mussels and bivalves and gastropods, at least in the Southeast. Uh, we at University of Florida Museum has an equally, it has a larger collection than we do. But they have a different focus, so. Okay, I see, I see. So. Uh, yeah, the collection, go ahead. <laughs> The, uh, the collection really began about 1973 when Roland Shelley, our late curator of millipedes and centipedes, uh, began work here and given some shells and he did some field work on freshwater plants. It was, as, as a museum collection, it's relatively young, but as was pointed out yesterday, most museum collections are not just of the materials that a particular researcher has collected, but also as an accumulation and agglomeration of lots of other materials that have been donated, uh, museum collections that have been donated, or research projects that are donated. So it, it comes as um, in, in bits and starts. As Gabriella mentioned yes, uh, yesterday, we also received a large collection of marine mollusks of North Carolina from the Institute of Marine Sciences right as I began here. And this um, is, is the foundation of our large marine collection. And I brought some material for the freshwater mollusk collection. But probably the, the greatest contribution to our diversity is uh, the Herb Atherin collection largest private collection of freshwater mollusks, uh, probably in North America. It was about 20, about 23,000 catalog lots of material, both freshwater snails, freshwater clams. But we gross, grossly underestimated the, the uh, quantity. Once we moved it and we were able to catalog the uh, freshwater gastropods, we were off by one, probably two orders of magnitude. Just in the freshwater gastropods, there are over 650,000 specimens and about 10,000 lots. So tremendous amount of material. So that brings up to, uh, yeah, we're, right now we're at about 70,000 lots of catalog material, about 1.2 uh, million specimens that are, are database. Um, and then people go, well, how big is the collection? You go, well, <laughs> we talk about what's database, what's cataloged. And then there's always that gorilla sitting in the corner that nobody really wants to acknowledge is the unprocessed incoming material. We keep nibbling at that every day, chewing on it, cataloging more material, entering materials of the collection, voucher material coming in. And we are talking with Jamie Smith, my collection manager. We're not real sure. We're estimating another 30, 40,000 lots, probably another 200,000. I, I hesitate to make those estimates because the last time I estimated, 
I was off by a significant amount. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. There's, there's one of the things that, uh, you know, a museum collection is never finished. You're adding new material, you're adding data, you're upgrading the data. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, a living organism. It, it has to be fed, it has to be cared for. And uh, maintaining the alcohol levels, the humidity levels. So it's, uh, it's a full-time job. And the thing that I like to stress to people coming in, it's a constantly learning new information. You know, people come to, to volunteer, to intern. We always tell them, if you're not learning half a dozen new things every day that you come in, either you didn't come in or you're asleep. Because if there's any any basic enthusiasm or curiosity, it's it's an open book. This is mollusks are the second largest group, nature group of uh, animals on the planet after arthropods and insects. So, oh, impressive. tremendous. Yes, we have a, tr a tremendous opening uh, due to con size constraints. We focus just on the marine mollusk of North Carolina. And we're focusing on primarily on the land snails of North Carolina, the freshwater gastropods in North Carolina. But with the Ather collection coming in, to be able to understand what's in North Carolina, we have one of the larger collections of, of freshwater gastropods of the southeastern United States. With the southeastern United States being one of the global hotspots of biodiversity, the uh, highest diversity of freshwater bivalves, freshwater gastropods, and the Tennessee, Cumber Tennessee Basin and the Alabama River Basin are real hotspots of diversity. And the next most diverse group or river basin would be the Mekong in Southeast Asia. So it's very important to understand what's going on. And since North Carolina chairs the Atlantic Basin rivers. We also have tributaries going into the Ohio Basin and into the Upper Tennessee, which also drains into the Ohio. So being a, a large natural history museum like we are, situated in a region that has such tremendous diversity, what does, uh, do, do people from North Carolina, like, do you go to the Tennessee River Basin and do research and do studies and then bring that material and that research back to North Carolina? Um, how does the collection get used or how do you do field research thinking about, you know, the incredible diversity that's out there and that's available uh, being a part of the museum? I, my, my career as a graduate student began working on, on freshwater mussels in Tennessee and, and the Tennessee River Basin. And uh, we finished the book on that. And I was uh, enticed, I guess is the polite way to put it, into working on the mussels of Alabama, since I, the uh, Tennessee River goes through Northern Alabama. And it was an opportunity to learn more about the Alabama Basin fauna. and. Uh, my major professor at that time said, you didn't learn anything that, from writing that first book, did you? <laughs> so these become uh, projects with life of their own. And no matter how, how, how much you try to push them, they take as much time as they're going to take. And a lot of it, once, once you've started, <laughs> you're along for the ride. Um, part of the thing is how do, how do we use the collection. I use it for answering questions on and collaborating with people on uh, DNA, on shell morphology, on comparative anatomy, and being a material for, you know, colleagues in Canada asking questions about species that occur in the Tennessee Basin. Uh, we also are doing the same thing with people that we're working with from Mexico and uh, California, Arizona, Utah, on integrating what we have. That's one of the things I forgot to mention is that our database is goes online, it goes up and it's, it's picked up by GBIF and by uh, 
three or four other uh, invert based groups. So the data is widely available. So with being widely available, we can request, uh, we have a, a graduate student working in France on freshwater mussels in the Nile and the Rift Lake uh, of East Africa. He wants to borrow material when we finally get back open to continue her graduate program because she didn't have material collected from uh, the lower Nile River, which I happened to be able to collect 15 years ago. And uh, little pieces come together, but uh, people call and say, you know, do you have? Uh, we had a call about land snails uh, and their rasping patterns or uh, snail trails. So <laughs> the questions come in all over the place. Um, one of the things that we, we found is that it makes life a lot easier collaborating with colleagues around the world and loaning material or serving as a repository for material coming in, uh, like colleagues in Russia, we try to uh, serve as a repository outside of Russia for type material that otherwise would be difficult to access. And we're also trying to deposit material of work done in Southeast Asia in museums in Southeast Asia, and also including all of these people in research programs, publications, so that we're, we're improving or providing new information back to the country that we've been allowed to work in. So it, it, the question always is, well, this is North Carolina. Well, as Gabriella pointed out, animals don't understand political boundaries. And you know, you, you work in North Carolina, but we have drainages going into several other states. Well, we need to know what's there. So, okay, we, 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 we understand what we have here in North Carolina. Where does it fit in the bigger picture of North America? And within freshwater clams, we have two, two families and uh, two subfamilies basically that are represented in North America. One is only represented in North America. So you have to look at what's in Europe. You have to look at what's in the rest of the world to understand the evolution diversity here in North Carolina. So it, it, keeps, <laughs> it keeps growing, opportunities increase and um, it's a challenge. So tell me a little bit then about the diversity that we have in the mollusk collection at the museum. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically, you know, what are some of the, the strangest specimens or the biggest or the smallest? Uh, what's the sort of breadth of the collection like? Uh, we have the freshwater clams have a, have a larval stage glochidia, which is only maybe a tenth to a fifth, a tenth or so of a, mil, of a millimeter in diameter would be our very smallest material. But actual shells, some of the land snails are maybe two millimeters tall and as an adult. And our largest specimen would be an, a rhomboid squid, which is about a meter long or a little more that uh, came up from the Caribbean, but occurs off the coast of North Carolina. So again, due to constraints, we only focus on the marine mollusks of North Carolina. It's about 1,100 species of marine mollusks. But the, the important thing to keep in mind is the diversity of, of mollusks is clams, snails, octopus and squid, uh, chitons, coat of male shells, tusk shells. So there's, there's a tremendous diversity right there. People want to say, well, I want to be working in the marine world. There's a whole tremendous fauna. We're at the southern end of the of the boreal fauna coming down. We're on the, um, the northern end of the subtropical uh, Gulf Stream coming up to Cape Hatteras. So we're at the, the great ends of both of these two faunas. So it increases our diversity tremendously. Uh, land snails, we have about 200 species in North Carolina native. And there's probably another 20 or more invasive species, introduced species, about 60 species of so of freshwater gastropods, about 65 species of freshwater clams just in North Carolina. 
we get about 25 species from the, the Tennessee Basin of freshwater clams. The rest, uh, one of the one of the neat things <clears throat> is contrary to people's popular belief that freshwater clams are dull, they're boring, they're brown, and they look like pet rocks. We have two species here in the state that have spines. Around the world, there are five species in, in fresh water that have spines, and we have two of them. So we're doing, doing very well. Probably the oddest would be carrier shells. It's a marine, a marine snail that to enlarge its footprint and cut down on crabs preying on it, will add other shells, other pieces of, of rock or debris and attach it to the sides of the shells, increasing the size. So a crab comes along and tries to snip off the, uh, the shells so you can get back to the meat. They've got to go through all this other debris and it also acts as camouflage. That's probably the neat, one of the neatest shells. The, um, <clears throat> each group has its own uh, kind of fun thing. Some of the land snails, put, slugs being land snails without a shell. Um, the, the, some of the land snails, they're, they're tall, slender, or they're, they're very, very compressed, living in, in narrow cracks. So it's hard with, with mollusks, it's a hard, hard job to pick your, your, fa your, your favorite. So uh, let's go back because you mentioned uh, freshwater clams or freshwater mussels with spines. Why, why does a clam do with spines? This has been a question because um, they're usually only in juvenile mussels and they, um, the, the largest one that occurs in the Altamaha River in central Georgia uh, will continue growing. These animals live anywhere from 10 to probably 30 or 40 years. So after about five years, they stop adding spines. And as far as we can tell is these live in a, in a shifting sand environment. So these are like stabilizers. You put out spines going out, keeps you, keeps you stable and it keeps you from being blown out of the sand uh, at, high, at uh, high volume or anything like that. Makes a lot of neat. sense. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to remind everybody, if you're wherever you're tuning in on YouTube or on Facebook and you have questions for art, questions about the mollusk collection or the research that goes on, leave your questions in the chat boxes in the comments. In just a moment, I'll be going to see what's going on there. We'll grab questions and comments and pose them to art. So we've got an expert on freshwater diversity here. <laughs> leave, leave your questions and comments for us. One of the things I should mention before we go to the questions is that we also work very closely with the North Carolina Shell Club. And every year, except this one, uh, we've had a, they, had, they host a, a shell show, can't even speak this one, shell show down in, in Wilmington. It's been historically in Wilmington. And uh, large crowds come in, people have exhibits, uh, shell dealers, but it's an opportunity to, to interact with a whole other group of enthusiasts. You know, birders have their own small groups that they work with. Uh, the Herb Society has a, has a group they work with, but the North Carolina Show Club has four meetings a year. And uh, again, a, a different area of outreach. And, you know, I'm thinking too of something else uh, that I saw come through sort of the museum news lately. Uh, and something that I talked with our director, Eric, about on Monday was ways that research collections like this one modernize and uh, stay relevant to scientists and to the public. Tell us a little bit about this freshwater mussel app that you were involved in. Okay, the, one of the problems that we have, whether it's uh, our consultants or graduate students or shell collectors, how do you identify a freshwater clam? Most people are totally unaware that there are these bivalves that live solely in fresh water. And uh, 
one day at a meeting, we were sitting having lunch under a tree and Susan Nutker from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Atlanta politely said, oh, you know, we really need a, an app like the birders have or plants have that on identifying these things. The problem was the next morning we got back together and it still sounded like a good idea. <laughs> However, at, looking at the, how do you separate out 300 species or 290 species of native North American freshwater clams presented a challenge. So her, our first release came, just came out. We're now in the process of looking to expand the information you can access. You think you've identified it correctly, there are pictures. But now we're trying to expand, including maps of where it occurs, host fish, uh, biology, what's its ecology, and how do you get into the literature on it? So it's a it's a new a new toy. In fact, I just uh, in end of January gave a presentation on the app to an, uh, a European Union funded program in Brussels on on the app and because they're talking about putting together a similar sort of thing for they only have about six currently about 16 species they recognize of freshwater clams in Europe. Yeah. That's a small app. And it's free on both for the Apple and for the uh, uh, other platforms. Go out to Google Store or to uh, what's the uh, Apple, Store. Apple Store and you look for Muscle ID and it's free. And if you got a problem with it, let us know. <laughs> so if I were hanging out in like a local river here in the Piedmont, North Carolina, in the triangle and you happen to, to turn up a, a shell, mm -hmm. I could use the app and probably get a pretty good identification, even maybe as a non-expert. Yes, that's, Very that's much who we're trying to reach out to is, is anybody that's interested or has questions about mussels, how do, how do you identify it? They're, they're not just a whole series of terms because one of the things biology suffers for them, there's a whole different vocabulary. We've added a series of figures to ex explain what all these structures are talking about. We want to talk about pseudocardinal teeth. You know, clams don't really have teeth, but structurally they have this protuberance that are referred to as teeth that stabilize the shells. And there's pictures of them. Some shells have them, some don't. And that's a major division right off the right off the right off the bat. I'm noticing something here too. I keep saying mussels. You keep saying clams. I'm 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 pretty sure that I must be wrong. No, no. This is one of the shortcomings okay. of, of English. When we say clams, people think of surf clams, quahogs, femurs, little necks, things we eat. You say mussels, they immediately think of the green mussel, blue mussels, again, things we eat. The mussels attached with a bissel thread to those little uh, chitinous threads where they attach to rocks or to the pilings. Clams are free living in the sand. When you tell people they live in fresh water, they're not part of our everyday life. Native Americans use them for, for food, for uh, tools. Um, they're not important to us, but they should be because they provide a tremendous uh, economic resource through Mother Nature's filtering system. We all re rely on, on fresh water to drink. And if we'd stop putting all of the crap in the water, then uh, the mussels would be able to help us considerably. But um, exception, but there's no, you know, whether it's a freshwater clam, freshwater mussel, there are some mussels that occur that are, that are related to blue mussels that occur in freshwater. This is one of the other problems when people talk about freshwater clams. There are 19 different families around the world that are freshwater bivalves living in freshwater. Not all of them are related to what we call freshwater bivalves here in North America. It, uh, there are pill clams, fingernail clams, 
that ducks and a number of fish re rely on its food. That's a whole other, there's a whole other universe, right? <laughs> another rabbit hole to go down. Well, so you bring up another interesting point um, and something that we talked about when we were discussing the fish collection yesterday too, is how these collections of things, you know, jars and jars and shelves and shelves of specimens contribute to wildlife and wild place conservation. And, and you alluded to it there talking about protecting freshwater stream habitats and, and uh, you know, where these streams begin, where mm -hmm. we get clean water from. How do you use the collection to conserve, you know, of course, not only just freshwater clams, but also these habitats that they live in? One of the things is we, we work closely with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. We work with the U.S. Geological Survey providing data for uh, endangered, uh, endangered species, but it's uh, specifically all the records for invasive species like the Asian glam and everybody's great friend, the, uh, the zebra mussels, guaga mussels, these sorts of things. Again, all the locality data that we have provides information for them. One of the other things that's less obvious is we work very closely with the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, development of the Red List. And I'm currently working with two professors at two different universities in Portugal that have a class, <clears throat> a class on assessing species, their conservation status. And we're working on 60 species of freshwater clams in North America that either have not been assessed or are um, way out, the assessments are way out of date. So this again is using our data, other museum data to look at the total range, how much has it changed, uh, combining our data with Fish and Wildlife Service data. We've uh, I've served on several committees with Fish and Wildlife Service on endangered species for providing data like the Tar River spiny mussel, uh, the dwarf wedge mussel, uh, the yellow lance, which is also here in North Carolina. So this is all headed towards conservation, both here in the United States and around the world. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna go to the chat box now. So everybody, questions, comments, post them there, and we'll take a few minutes to see what your thoughts are. Uh, first off, let's see. All right, Miranda. Miranda Dowdy is watching. Hi, Miranda. Uh, so Miranda says that she actually worked on the Athern, did I say it right? Athern collection 10 years ago. Yes, yes, yes. And do you have any favorite Athern quotes? <laughs> uh... If I can, maybe I can seed this one too. Uh, Miranda says that hers was something like, quote, there is a bloated raccoon carcass floating in the canal. It is a beautiful day, end quote. Herb was uh, colorful. He uh, had been uh, released from the, uh, or mustered out of the army at the end of World War II, diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Spent 30 years working for the post office and all of his spare time was spent collecting mussels and snails. His catalog is full of information and his field notes collected negative data. Uh, some of his observations are not politically correct today, <laughs> but, um, and Herb liked his, his moonshine and his home brew. So you were never oh, sure gosh. what, <laughs> He, he was very colorful and a lot of a lot of fun. Uh, okay. Thanks to his efforts that we have that tremendous collection. All right. Let's see. Do we have any chambered nautilus in the collection? Of course, yes. I should say Jamie Smith is in the comments here too, answering questions as they're coming in too. So hi, Jamie. Thanks. Thanks for jumping in there. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. I mean, it's awesome. There's great conversation happening. Um. Yes, we do have. Have Nautilus, the if I remember correctly, site the CITES, the Conservation International Trade on what is it, endangered species. They're not 
apparently they're not supposed to be sold today or trade got sold today. We have a, a an exhibit that was up in the old museum when we were still in the agriculture department, or Betsy built a new NEC building. And uh, we also have the uh, octopus, the uh, chamber, they're not the Nautilus, but the, uh, there's one squid that lays down a, uh, a shell, uh, the females do, that uh, is, is a case, casing for their, their eggs. Um, but again, these are South Pacific. So we use them for examples of, of another group of cephalopods, but uh, a very limited number. Ali watching has a weird question. Good. Do you know how common leeches are in North Carolina or how many species there are in the state? Jamie says there are over 700 species described in general, but it depends on whether you're talking terrestrial or fresh water. That would be something. That, that would be a question for uh, Bronwyn Williams, our curator of uh, non-molluscan invertebrates. Uh, we see them, it's, it's kind of strange to be in the, in, the, uh, in the tropics and you hear the leaves rustling and you know it's not a, a, a vertebrate and you see this little animal just humping along <laughs> because it senses you <laughs> and looking for you there. Uh, you know, if you're if you're not using boots in, in any of the rivers here or any of the swamps, you can act very effectively collect leeches. <laughs> They'll find you. Exactly. Let's see. Uh, I think you answered this one really early, but what's the largest specimen in the collection? Rhomboid squid. It uh, is about a, a little over a meter long. It's in a big... Uh, Aluminum tank. What mollusk has the best scientific name? Well, how about, how about Lancelaria Bogani? Who's that one named for? <laughs> it's, a, it's a patronym, but uh, Elliptio spinosa probably is is one of the one of the stronger ones. Um, it, it's the Spiny River, but uh, hmm? oh, on on the coast we have Crepidula and Crepidula fornicata, Plana, and there's several other species. And if you pick up a a, a conch or you you see a um, horseshoe crab. These are gastropods that are limpet-like that attach to them. They have a little shelf that the uh, the abductor muscle attach their muscles attached to inside the shell. Uh, and they also are bizarre because they stack, and they change. And as you you move further up, further down in the stack, they change from male to female. I think that's right. They they do change change sex with age. Oh wow. There's a whole other the biology of these animals. A uh, friend in Australia and California just come out with a two volume set on most of the things you need to know about mollusks. So there's plenty of reading. Here's another one for you. How many freshwater mussel species live in North Carolina? Uh, and even more locally, how many are in Wake County? There are about 65 species in North Carolina, depending on what day it is and how the taxonomy, how the taxonomy is going. How many in Wake County? Uh, I would say right off the top of my head, uh, about 12, because we have the yellow lamp, we have or had populations like uh, the yellow lamps in the, in the lower part of uh, tributaries to the news. The, um, historically, we would have had the Tar River spiny mussel, but it hasn't been seen here for, for years. Uh, with the industrialization, the spread of suburbia and everything and the impact on the rivers, a lot of these animals have disappeared like Crabtree Creek is down to probably a single species. Uh, the Noose River in eastern Wake County had like six different species originally described from there. It's probably all one species today, but 
Let's see here. Uh, Cameron on Facebook says that they went to the Button Museum in Iowa and in from the 1890s to the 1960s, they used a clam in the Mississippi River to make buttons. Do we help with conservation for that species in the river that used to be made into buttons? That's a, that's a great part of, of American history that most people are totally unaware of. Your grandfather, your great grandfather would have had a white shirt to go to go to church and it would have had pearl buttons, buttons that were cut out of freshwater clam shells. <clears throat> they used upwards of <clears throat> probably 14 species. So it wasn't a single species, but things like washboard, the three ridge, um, the ebony shell, all of them with the, the inside having mother of pearl and being a white color, uh, an iridescent white would be used for buttons. Um, fortunately, <clears throat> Three of those species are, are were very common and still remain. They're very widespread and, and abundant. Um, things like the monkey face seem to be doing more poorly. So conserving the, these things will live oftentimes in the big rivers like the Mississippi in mussel beds, where there'll be concentrations of like 100 animals per square meter. And these beds can run on for half a mile being maybe 300 feet wide. So there are tremendous concentrations of entering filtering capacities. They also provide structure for the bottom. A lot of uh, aquatic insects use the, uh, is the outsides of the shells for uh, like caddisflies attaching their, their cases to the, so they can pupate. Um, So conservation of, of, of the really rare species also impacts the conservation of these, these more common species. On a similar note, Zach has got a good question. Are there any citizen science projects that involve collecting data about mollusks? Um, or other ways that people get involved in, in California, mollusk science? Looking at land seals on, on well, the... the let the, the citizen science projects that working on mollusks that I'm familiar with have usually been with land snails, um, uh, bio blitzes, and then they, where they go out and they collect everything and identify everything and say a, in a park or a particular park, a uh, particular mountain in the Smokies. Freshwater clams present a different problem. One, uh, not all of them live in water that's weightable. Or clear, <laughs> a lot of our black water streams on the coast, and um, down there you also share them with alligators. So uh, there's that, there's an added level of excitement. But as far as freshwater mussels and citizen science projects, because so many of them are federally endangered and so many of them are, are difficult to identify, we, we've been having problems with that. Uh, we're all we're working with Gabriella and everybody on the uh, citizen science project of transcribing field notes and, and transcribing data from uh, like the Herb Atherin field notebooks, getting that data into a database, one for the negative data where he had sites that he looked at in 1955 and there were no muscles. And he looked at every little trickle of water that he could find. So it wasn't just big rivers with all the rich points at you know the same five sites on the clinch river in north southeastern or southwestern virginia he was all over so that's the way that i see that uh, citizens being involved with with citizen science for, for for muscles at the present time um learning more about them and asking questions and if you see something that's odd taking pictures of it sending it to us and uh We'll try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's see. I'm going to get caught up on the comments over here uh, because Jamie has been dropping all kinds of great <laughs> knowledge right over here. Uh, let's see. Jamie said uh, you keep adding species daily so she can't keep up. Exactly. With a number in North Carolina. Uh, oh, and that in the collection, there are several shells that have the buttonholes cut out. Right, right. If somebody wants to see them, we have, we have a three ridge. 
shell that we can show and, and a large uh, washboard shell that we can be happy to show them. We also have an exhibit that a woman, a shell collector in South Carolina put together on them that we haven't been able to get up to, to display in the collection. And let's see, Jamie mentioned a land snail collecting in the Blue Ridge Parkway. Yep. You mentioned land yes. snails, uh, transcribing field notes. Yep. And, uh, and that freshwater mussels are not generally used for citizen science because you do need permits. Permits become a real problem. And uh, even collecting like in the upper clinch, which has uh, like 25 endangered species in a, in a one mile stretch of the river, it begins to get really, really uh, a problem. And now getting permits collected in other countries is becoming more stringent, more, re more regulations. And in mm -hmm. fact, in India and Brazil, with the uh, with new laws and uh, international protocols, nothing, none of no biological material is leaving the country that I'm aware of. So we're working to collaborate with people to answer questions on the fauna in those particular countries. All right. Well, looking at the clock, uh, I think I've taken us over time <laughs> at this point. So, uh, Art, thank you for being here. Thanks for thank sharing you. the moss collection with us. And, and uh, people have questions, ask. Ask. Easy <laughs> as that. Send Art an email. Take pictures. <laughs> Get involved. Um, check out naturalsciences.org for more information. You can read up more, a little bit more on the mollusk collection there. Uh, I think there's even links, or at least you can find access to some of the research that's been going on there out of that collection. Uh, also, big thank you to collections manager for mollusk, Jamie, for hanging out in the chat here on YouTube and contributing uh, so much great knowledge and insight as well. So many oh. thanks. One other thing that I'd like to mention, people were asking about the app. There's also a yes. key and workbook to freshwater freshwater clams, freshwater mussels of North Carolina. It's available as a PDF on my section on the research and collections webpage. Uh, there are several things there. There's one for Maryland, one for South Carolina that are free to download. So yeah, we try to make as much of this available it includes, uh, Maryland one includes maps and pictures and basic information on biology and, and conservation status. There you go, everybody. Naturalsciences.org, look under the research tab and take advantage of the resources that are there. All right, one more time. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate the Art. opportunity. Happy. NC Museum Week, everybody. Thanks for joining us, tuning in. We'll be back here on YouTube tomorrow at noon and again Friday at noon. Tomorrow we'll be talking with the research curators and collection managers for ornithology, that's birds. And on Friday, we're talking reptiles and amphibians with our herpetology folks. So make sure that you subscribe to the museum on YouTube. That way you can get notifications when the videos are going live. You can set reminders to, so that you get a little ping to let you know when the program is happening and continue to follow the museum on social media. We're at natural sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you again at noon tomorrow for the rest of museum week. Bye everybody.